Karen, you have you have laid out in broad strokes what seems to me to be a movement, a global movement for reparations, specifically for people of African descent. And I, I just want to dig more into it. The New York Times recently did an article called The Long Road Ahead for Colonial Reparations, in which they they did uh, mention, um, as you did, Germany paying $1.3 billion to Namibia, but it was called aid. It wasn't uh, call, certainly called reparations. And they also talked about the return of artifacts that were stolen um, by several European uh, governments. That is, that is still going on. Uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, is as far back as 1961, Franz Fanon wrote, end quote, the wealth of the imperialist nations is also our wealth. Europe is literally the creation of, you know, of, of, from us, from our work. And then you had an economist from St. Lucia back in the 1930s, also cited in that New York Times article that says the debt is not just repayment, but also reconstitution. And they cited, of course, Haiti's uh, president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, the first democratically elected president who demanded reparations. And even the New York Times series had to admit that this was the cause of him being deposed with uh, a collaboration of France, the United States, Canada and their European allies. So Dr. Horn, what I wanted you to comment on is that reparations can be proposed or implemented, it seems, in a number of ways. You talked about California. We know that in the United States, there are various forms of, uh, of reparations being proposed. There's an article that has a long list of what's being proposed in the, in the different states. And then you also have Hillary Beckles, who are saying, uh, who heads the Caribbean, the CARICOM Caribbean initiative, saying that as far as the UK, $50 billion, $50 billion is just a starting point because it really should be something like seven trillion pounds. So your thought on all of these different proposals, because what has to look at the reality of it, is this gonna be genuine reparations at the end of the day, or just some other uh, band-aid that props up the capitalist structure? Do things fundamentally have to change for reparations actually be paid and have meaning? Well, it depends on the, co the correlation of forces. I mean, uh, th there are no guarantees. It depends on uh, our ability to mobilize and organize and galvanize uh, those on our side. And speaking of California, uh, I interviewed on KPFK, uh, Professor Jovan Lewis of UC Berkeley uh, who was part of this reparations team uh, designated by Sacramento to investigate this question, uh, they will be holding further hearings in coming months. And I urge and encourage uh, those in California in particular uh, who are interested in this issue uh, to perhaps uh, get on the list to testify, perhaps to uh, send your proposals uh, to uh, Professor Lewis and the reparations team. And, and by the way, uh, the interview was on uh, Freedom Now, 11 a.m. Saturdays at KPFK can be found in the archive. But with regard to your point uh, concerning Frantz Fanon, uh, that point that he made uh, is nothing new. It was given a scholarly heft by the founding father of Trinidad and Tobago, speaking of uh, Eric Williams and his Oxford University dissertation then published as a book by the University of North Carolina Press, Capitalism and Slavery, uh, given further heft by the late uh, Guyanese scholar Walter Rotney in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and fortunately still in the land of the living is the University of Rochester historian, the Nigerian, uh, Joseph Inakori, uh, in his book, Africa and the Industrial Revolution in England. Uh, 
And uh, these scholars and others who I could have mentioned have all made a solid case for the point, for the irrefutable point, that capitalism itself uh, came onto the world stage dripping with the blood of Africans and the indigenous from every poor, and there needs to be justice. Now, uh, what folks need to realize is that uh, as ever, uh, Africans are in the forefront, but a success for people of African descent will have knock-on effects for others. For example, your audience was probably familiar with the fact that the Greek government for decades has been pressing London to return uh, certain artistic treasures, because as you know, during its heyday, the British Empire was known for looting universally. And I dare say that if reparations for slavery takes flight, the Greek claim will likewise uh, take flight. And I should also say that uh, it's very important that this meeting that launched our discussion took place in Ghana, West Africa, which came to independence in 1957 under Kwame Nkrumah, uh, which pledged to move forward with regard to Pan-Africanism and took as a major cause independence of the Congo, uh, which was coming into existence circa 1960-61, despite the CIA-engineered assassination of founding father Patrice Lumumba. And then, of course, Nkrumah himself was overthrown by the CIA and the Ghanaian military in 1966. Interestingly enough, and this is something that we must pay attention to, the U.S. ambassador to Ghana at the time of the Nkrumah overthrow was an NAACP official, formerly speaking of Franklin Williams of California. So there are a lot of contradictions uh, for us to sort out on this path to reparations, but I'm confident that uh, we will be able to make this journey victoriously and that reparations, as your latter point suggested, uh, won't wind up being just another band-aid. Yeah, I mean, we have seen some examples of, and by the way, I'm all for reparation. Just, I think we have to look at all of the different angles and all of the implications of it. But we saw, for example, that the UK had to pay uh, reparations for the massacre that they did in Kenya. And I think it was something like 30 million dollars. This was the massacre that happened in Kenya in the 1950s. I'm not sure. I'm, I, I have, I don't know where that money went, um, how, what positive or negative impact it had on grassroots people. And we know that other forms of reparations have been paid. I mean, you talked about the Japanese internment. Of course, there's the, there's the Holocaust. Um, some smaller amounts of reparations uh, paid for people who are victims of that Tuskegee Institute and, and Rosewood, that white riot that happened, Rosewood in, in Florida, and really a pittance, uh, frankly. And North Carolina, I think, established a small fund for victims of forced sterilization. And in California, there was some legislation around having to recognize forced sterilization in California prisons. So there have been a few examples of reparations being paid. And I wonder your thoughts, uh, Dr. Horn, on the impact of reparations being paid as opposed to reparations not being paid and the difference also between reparations and aid, because I note your, your point that Germany called what they uh, paid to Namibia aid and, and didn't admit that actually it was a form of reparations. Dr. Horn. Well, you know, it's a, it's a struggle just like anything else. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the anti-Jim Crow movement in the United States of America. Uh, there were victories. It, we could have had even more victories if the organized left led by Paul Robeson were not decapitated. And so the same holds true today in 2022, that obviously it's not as if uh, those who were placing demands on uh, 
will say, you, you know what? Your demands are just. Where do we sign up? No, <laughs> it has to be demanded. And, and uh, whether or not these demands will be met is, is still an open question. And how these demands will eventuate is still an open question. But having said that, uh, I think that there are some positive signs. Uh, for example, you might have noticed that uh, many uh, Western European leaders are making tracks to Algeria in particular. Algeria was colonized by the French quite brutally and bloodily circa 1830. There was a bloody war of independence uh, culminating in victory in 1962. However, since that time, there has been bruised feelings in Algiers in particular, and recall in this context that it was Algiers that opened its door in the 1960s to an international legation of the Black Panther Party. And so now you saw President Macron uh, beating a path to Algiers because Algiers is a major producer of natural gas. With the boycott of natural gas affixed to Russia, the Western European countries feel that they must make nice with Algiers, Algeria, which gives Algeria leverage. The same holds true for Nigeria, a former site, I'm afraid to say, of the unlimited African slave trade, but now a major producer of petroleum, likewise for Angola, uh, due south, just north of Namibia. And with this attempt to boycott Russian oil that puts more emphasis on Nigerian and Angolan oil, uh, this then puts more wind in the sails of African nations, giving them more leverage to make concrete demands to their former colonizers. Now, part of the difficulty we face here in the United States is that uh, even in the most elevated sectors of our movement, oftentimes there's little awareness of global events. This is a direct result of the aforementioned decapitation of our most internationalist sector, speaking of Paul Robeson and his comrades, uh, that deficit, that defeat has yet to be overcome. And so you have this contradiction of many in the reparations movement in the United States who understandably, perhaps justifiably, have a very sour opinion of the rulers of the United States, but yet they feel they can get reparations without having a global movement which presupposes awareness of what's going on in Africa, in Europe, worldwide. Now, obviously that's an unsustainable posture to adopt and that's just one more barrier we'll have to overcome on our road to victory. Yeah, Dr. Horn, we're gonna continue this discussion, but we're gonna have to just take pause for a moment for a short station break. And when we return, we're going to continue this fascinating conversation on reparations. And also we'll be talking about the Kenya election. Stay with us, we'll be right back. And this is Margaret Prescott, host of Sojourner Truth. You are listening to KPFK 90.7 FM. This is the host of Sojourner Truth. If you've missed any part of this hour from 10 this morning for 90 days after that, just go to kpfk.org, scroll down to archives, 
click on Sojourner Truth, you'll be able to hear the show in its entirety. And you can subscribe for a free podcast. If you're a member of Facebook, you can like and friend us there. Our handle on Instagram and Twitter at So True Radio. You can check out our website at www.sotrueradio. And also, we are heard nationwide and worldwide on SoundCloud. And today, we'd like to give a shout out to our listeners in, in Jackson, suffering so much right now, Jackson, Mississippi. And internationally, we'd like to give a shout out to our SoundCloud listeners everywhere they are in the diaspora, in the Americas, in the continent, as well as in the Caribbean region. This is Margaret Prescott, and our guest is Dr. Gerald Horn, a regular here on Sojourner Truth. And we're discussing right now reparations because a lot of activity happening around uh, reparations. Uh, Recently, in August of 2022, a gathering was held in Accra in Ghana. They came out with the Accra Declaration. And in the United States, there are a number of states that are and cities including the city of Rhode Island that are looking for ways that they could at least pay some form of reparations as well as the Jesuits and Dr. Horn made some mention of that earlier. Dr. Horn in the Accra Declaration, I'm I'm looking at that right now, getting back to the kind of economy that we need to be aiming for for reparations to have the meaning that all of us hope it would. A point five in the declaration, it says, quote, we charge that global Africans work for the development of prosperous economies based on values of African humanism and principles of inclusive economic rights, including Dr. Martin Luther King's call for an economic bill of rights to create independent, self-reliant, Afro-centered knowledge uh, systems. So here they are hinting, it seems to me, that there have to be some change or a different kind of focus of economies. And, And Dr. Horn, you have made the point that this has to be a global movement. And clearly it has to be a global grassroots movement to have any leverage to move any of this forward. Uh, But your thoughts on the, you know, these economies based on values of African humanism, Dr. Horn. Let me try to put some flesh on those bones. Uh, Reparations, if it's to be meaningful, has to be part and parcel and a component of what should be the order of the day, which is redistribution of wealth this time from top to bottom, unlike what oftentimes happens in Washington when there's redistribution from bottom to top. I should also say that uh, reparations in some ways will mirror the anti-apartheid movement which culminated in the first democratic elections in South Africa in 1994. Recall that in the run-up to those 1994 elections in South Africa, You had congressional legislation in Washington in the mid-1980s. You had a reparations movement on campuses whereby universities were forced to divest themselves from holdings and corporations that had invested in apartheid South Africa. Uh, You had reparations in cities and municipalities on similar principles as well. And so there were these various rivulets that then had a confluence and a mighty stream that ultimately knocked down the sturdy walls of apartheid in South Africa. So likewise, you mentioned reparations efforts in the state of Rhode Island. There are reparations efforts unfolding as we speak in the city of Evanston, Illinois, the home of Northwestern University. We talked about the reparations effort in the state of California. There's congressional legislation, formerly under the rubric of H.R. 40, but now it has a different name, uh, that has been debated in Congress. As well, you've had a number of blueprints for reparations that have been put forward, including the award-winning book 
uh, by Duke University, uh, Professor William Darity, the leading economist, and his co-author, Kirsten Mullen, the book entitled From Here to Equality, Reparations for Black Americans in the 21st Century. If you look at the Journal of African American History, particularly under the editorship of V.P. Franklin, formerly of UC Riverside, uh, in the previous decade, there were a number of special issues outlining a blueprint for reparations. So a lot of the intellectual spade work has been done. The political spade work is now being conducted. And I think that as long as we keep our shoulders to the plow, our shoulders to the wheel, that we will emerge victorious. And we are already seeing, I mean, CARICOM back in 2014, they put forward, I think, a 10-point program uh, for reparations. We now see uh, Jamaica, for example, moving out on its own, de uh, demanding $10.6 billion uh, from the UK that they say equivalent to fees that were paid to uh, slave owners. On the continent, you see Burundi demanding $43 billion from uh, Germany. Now, all of this obviously will build the case and build the movement for reparations. The other um, part of it is determining the amount owed because as you know, um, a women's rights activist, in addition to being an anti-racist activist, and we know that well, actually, we don't know a lot about the contributions of enslaved women who, after all, did the work of producing the entire slave population. And, you know, I don't know what thoughts you might have on this, but it does seem to me as though that particular work done by enslaved women greatly increased the amount that are owed in reparations to people of African descent. Well, sure, and there's been a lot of scholarship on that as well. I'd point you to the recent Duke University Press book by Jennifer Morgan of NYU. Uh, you have increasingly scholars who are examining uh, enslavement, not only in the context of the forces of production, but also in the context of the forces of reproduction. Uh, that is to say, uh, outlining, as Professor Morgan does, the unique and special role of women, which was obviously essential to the entire system of enslavement. Uh, in fact, in a book I wrote some years ago on the African slave trade to Brazil, uh, I pointed out there that you had many slave owners in the United States who were objecting in the 1840s to bringing enslaved Africans from Angola and Mozambique to Brazil because they thought they could capture that market by dint of having forced reproduction in the state of Virginia. And Virginia was a kind of slave breeding colony uh, for decades, which obviously underscores the uh, special role that women uh, played uh, during this heinous system. And that, of course, that's just one aspect of a multifaceted question. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to know about that work and about production and, and reproduction that opens up a whole other discussion. Another thing, aspect of reparations that has come up more of late, um, starting with, with CARICOM, but also islands in the Pacific that are talking about reparations for the damage and the threat of climate change. We know that a lot of the climate damage produced by pollution and, and other actions in the global north, but it's countries of the global south and communities within the global south that pay the highest price. And so you had um, some of the CARICOM islands talking about reparations and for climate damage and climate change. And then at the end of August, beginning of September 2022, 
you had this horrific flooding in Pakistan where one third of Pakistan was under water. And Pakistan is saying that they will have to pay about $38 billion to the IMF, the World Bank, um, the Chinese State Bank, as well as others. And they are also saying that reparations must be considered. Uh, your thoughts on this particular angle of reparations as it relates to climate? The phrase climate refugees has already entered our lexicon. Uh, that is to say, the idea that certain parts of this small planet uh, may become inhabitable and that will cause so-called refugee flows. We know if we revisit what happened when you saw many Syrians uh, moving into Europe uh, some years ago, just a few years ago, uh, that it caused uh, quite a political ruckus. It certainly, uh, it seems, uh, helped to give altitude to the Alternative for Germany party, a, a neo-fascist party. Uh, you may have in elections in Italy in just a few days, a neo-fascist party uh, coming uh, to power, which is campaigning on an explicitly uh, anti-African platform. You've had many uh, Africans in particular trying to get across the Mediterranean uh, to Europe. Many of them, of course, uh, economic refugees, but some of them are climate refugees. And in that context, note that just in Rotterdam in the last few days, you had a special meeting whereby some of these issues were going to be discussed in the context of relations between Africa and Europe, but the Africans were complaining because they don't feel that the meeting was given sufficient attention by their European counterparts. Uh, keep in mind as well that uh, Mr. Biden has a special climate envoy, speaking of the former Massachusetts U.S. Senator John Kerry, and he's apparently uh, flying all over the world talking about climate because you have uh, an up upcoming uh, Congress of the People meeting that will be taking place in Egypt. Uh, fortunately, it will take, be taking place in Africa. The source of what I'm afraid to say will be many climate refugees, which is ironic in light of the fact that with regard to this pressing climate emergency, the issue in many ways was created in the global north, so-called, um, reference what we just said a few moments ago about the construction of capitalism, the construction of industrialization, which led to the proliferation of emissions, but yet it's the global south, so-called, that will be suffering uh, most of the pain and most of the damage. Uh, hopefully this meeting in Egypt uh, upcoming will be able to address these contradictions. Right, and, and Dr. Horn, we do want to move on to the Kenya elections, but just very quickly getting back to this uh, conversation on um, reparations and the Accra Declaration. One of the things that they call is they want to engage in a dialogue and discussion on the term global African. It's always been uh, some discussion about what we of African descent uh, should call ourselves from uh, Negroes, uh, for people in the United States, Afro-Americans, and then African-Americans and African-Caribbean, generally people of African descent. What do you think of the proposal to adopt the term global African as a, an inclusive identity of black people on the co every around the world. Uh, you know, it's all good. I, I have to confess, just personally, I'm a bit agnostic with regard to that question. I think all of those <laughs> uh, af aforementioned terms that you employ, so black, uh, African, Africana, etc., they all have their utility. And of course, this is not unique uh, to uh, Global Africans for black people, uh, I've been made to understand that the country we now know as Turkey now wants to be referred to as Turkey. Uh, they decided to change their name. Uh, I think that this is quite common nowadays because folks are not only seeking an identity, they're seeking an accurate descriptor. They're seeking 
a term, a phrase, that will encompass millions. And obviously, that is no minor feat. And I think that that leads to the debate. But once again, I'm willing to uh, sign on and co-sign whatever the consensus that emerged. Right, okay. Uh, fair, fair point. I'll have to confess that I've always been nervous about adding on the phrase American, Afro-American or African-American as opposed to black people, because then we kind of became American. And as you know, there's even controversy about what American even means as people generally refer to it as people in the United States. But that is not all of the Americas. And uh, just to say, it does seem to me as though the global African does put it more in an international context. But th that's, that's me. But Dr. Horn, I know you have to dash. We have, uh, with the time that we have left, I'm wondering your thoughts on the uh, Kenya election. That got quite a lot of publicity, uh, global publicity. And, you know, some controversy that, that went to court. Just give us your thoughts about this election. Lay out for our listeners um, who the candidates were. Uh, William Ruto now declared the winner. Your thoughts on all this, Dr. Horn. Well, it was a contentious election, which is to be expected. Uh, Mr. Ruto was a former vice president under the current president. Uhuru Kenyatta, that name may ring a bell. He's the son of founding father Jomo Kenyatta. But somehow Uhuru Kenyatta and Mr. Ruto, uh, his erstwhile vice president, had a falling out for reasons that remain a bit murky. And so what happens is that Mr. Kenyatta signed a deal to support the candidate Ryla Odinga. For those who are familiar with Kenyan history, you may recall that Odette, uh, excuse me, Kenyatta versus Odinga uh, was the descriptor for many political battles. That, that is to say, their fathers were battling before Uhuru Kenyatta and Raila Odinga were battling, and so they decided to have a handshake deal. But what happens is that uh, Mr. Ruto, somehow, despite the fact that he's one of the richest men in the country, was able to portray himself as a man of the people. Now, that should not be surprising to those of us who are familiar with the trajectory of Donald John Trump. And so it was a very close election. He won, speaking of Mr. Ruto, by a very narrow margin. Uh, keep in mind that in the past, Kenyan elections have been greeted, I'm afraid to say, by violence. This did not take place during this election, which is a good thing, needless to say. For Kenya is an anchor of stability, that is to say it's viewed as such in the Horn of Africa, in East Africa, I should say, uh, where there is uh, increasing instability. You know that in Somalia, uh, there is uh, the prospect of a famine. We know that in Ethiopia, that uh, there is uh, instability because of the uh, fight between the Tigrayan minority, only 6%, and the central government in Addis Ababa, uh, in neighboring South Sudan. Uh, elections have become a thing of the past. And so Kenya, because of its ability to have elections, because it's a regional headquarters of the United Nations, because it's also becoming a headquarters for software development, as is its counterpart across the continent, speaking of Nigeria, uh, this election was greeted with trepidation and with nervousness. Uh, thus far, it appears that the trepidation and nervousness may have been a bit overblown given the absence of violence. Mr. Ruto will be sworn in within days and hopefully his course will be as smooth as it merits. Right. And just, of course, that there was a challenge by Mr. Odinga to the election. Um, the Kenya's first woman chief justice, um, she made the decision and basically chided, it seems, um, the Odinga camp uh, that this challenge should not have been brought in the first place. But uh, Dr. Horn, just uh, quickly also, you know, Odinga, put forward the phrase hustler nation. 
and uh, hustler class, I suppose. And I suppose a number of young people were saying, well, you know, we're, we're struggling. We, we have to do whatever hustle we have to do in order to make ends meet. And I'm wondering kind of what that, what you take that uh, to mean and why that took on in the way that it did. I mean, he's talking about an economy from the bottom up, but as you said, he's, he's, he's from great wealth, Dr. Horn. Well, certainly it was Mr. Ruto, the apparent victor, who put forward the slogan, Hustler Nation. And I think as matters evolved, uh, that turned to be a grand hustle on his part, because obviously he was able to attract uh, many of the unemployed in Nairobi and Mombasa, the two major cities, uh, to his banner, uh, which is ironic because Mr. Ruto and Mr. Kenyatta, the current president, outgoing president, are two of the richest men in Africa, two of the richest men in Kenya, and yet they were, Mr. Ruto at least was able to betray himself as a man who pulled himself up by his bootstraps, uh, talking about his youth uh, selling chickens, and, and which of course grew into a kind of agribusiness and then spun off into other major investments. And so, as I said, in the United States, uh, you have a billionaire, speaking of Donald J. Trump, who obviously uh, carries the hopes and wishes of a significant percentage of the U.S. Euro-American working class and middle class. He got 74, 75 million votes in 2020. So that kind of hustle by Mr. Ruto in Kenya should not come as a shock on this side of the Atlantic. Absolutely. So, Dr. Horn. We just have like, I think about two minutes, two, three minutes before you have to dash. And, uh, you know, the Western press, they are saying, well, Ruta's victory in Kenya is a plus for democracy. And Odinga's loss is a plus for democracy because it shows that democracy works. But meanwhile, if you look at the nation that is held up as the flag bearer, so named of the United uh, of democracy, the United States, um, you know, I, I just wonder your thoughts on that because um, on this side here, we see threats to the so named uh, democracy. But on the other hand, the Kenya election is being held up as the direction of where things have to go. Just some final thoughts from you, Dr. Horn, on this and, and any other uh, point before you have to go. Well, obviously the United States is in a contradiction talking about democracy after January 6, 2021, an attempted coup after the possibility that Mr. Trump, uh, by means mostly foul, may return to the White House in January 2025. But with regard to your latter point, I should also mention that the president of South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, will be visiting the White House within the next 24 to 48 hours. Uh, obviously, he will be lobbied with regard to his nation's neutrality with regard to the crisis in the Ukraine. South Africa has come under tremendous pressure uh, as a result of its carrying with it a good deal of Africa with regard to this neutrality. And then again, uh, Mr. Ramaphosa, if he deigns to meet with many of the activists in the United States uh, who campaigned so tirelessly for him, the African National Congress to come to power in 1994, uh, may have to answer questions uh, concerning some of the internal developments uh, in South Africa itself, the explosion of xenophobia, particularly uh, targeting the tens of thousands of Zimbabweans who have crossed the border, the fact that uh, shops uh, owned by Somalis and Congolese have been attacked by xenophobes. In the person of Mr. Ramaphosa, uh, who you may know is under investigation by his colleagues in Parliament because it appears that he had millions of dollars in foreign currency uh, stuffed into a couch at one of his estates in the northern part of the country. And that has raised many an eyebrow, not only because we know that Mr. Ramaphosa, once again, is very affluent, but still, one wonders, has he heard of banks, for example? 
Has he heard of stock investments? Of course he has, but still, uh, this is a very serious matter and may, although I doubt it, uh, lead to this being dislodged from that high office. I'd just like to underscore again that about the film Suriana and the CIA, uh, George Clooney, who acted in that, there was uh, the CIA guy at the very end said corruption. That's how we get them. And I take that to mean movements in, in so many places around the world where corruption is encouraged as a way of defeating those movements. Thank you.